Now for pressure injuries, formerly called pressure ulcers. These result from damage to the skin or underlying tissues over a bony prominence, commonly from bedridden clients who are not turned adequately, or from a medical device due to intense or prolonged pressure, like long-term use of oxygen devices, like a nasal cannula or even an oxygen face mask. But typically, bed sores are the most tested here, resulting from bony prominences, basically areas that feel bony. So the top three most common areas are the lower back and buttocks, including the sacrum and coccyx, the heels and the ankles, and even the hip bones, very bony areas. These three are the most common areas for pressure injuries, but even the shoulder area like the scapula and the elbows are high risks. Now in terms of the causes and risk factors, just think of the patho here. The skin is breaking down from all that pressure, as well as other factors that can make the skin weak. So write this down. Bedridden clients who are immobile or immobile from either neuro issues, spinal injuries, or just intubated and sedated. Whatever the cause, being in bed for long periods of time degrades the skin. Secondly is incontinence or having a wet bed where clients can't keep urine in with incontinence. Now wet skin leads to skin breakdown. Another cause is from poor nutrition with low protein or low fluid intake. This puts the skin at higher risk for skin breakdown since it lacks the building blocks for healthy skin. Another cause is our diabetic neuropathy, the lack of sensation with our diabetic patients, and the lack of skin perfusion due to that thick syrupy blood, so we end up with foot ulcers, which are very common. And lastly, clients with liver cirrhosis have low albumin, the lack of albumin, which is that protein that attracts fluid back into the vascular spaces, so we end up with a bunch of fluid that leads to edema, basically waterbed skin, so a high risk for skin breakdown. Now, in terms of the six stages for pressure injuries, make sure to focus here on the pictures. The NCLEX and exit exams love to show pictures and ask you to name the stages. So stage number one, we have red skin that is intact and only affects the epidermis, the outermost layer of the skin. So just think only one layer of skin damage for stage one. Now it's non-blanchable, meaning that it does not turn white when pressed on, it stays red. Now if it is blanchable, then it's not a pressure injury yet. Now for stage two, the skin breaks and we have an open wound but just affecting the top two layers of skin, the epidermis and the dermis. Nursing school is hard work. SimpleNursing.com makes it simple. We take your classroom lectures and notes to create a handcrafted study plan with specialized videos and visual study guides that highlight only the top tested need to know key points, coupled with thousands of practice questions to test your knowledge, all neatly organized in our new app. Try it for free today. Visit SimpleNursing.com. So just think two layers of skin damage for stage two. The wound bed is red or pink and shiny or dry. Now for stage three, we have full thickness skin loss, extending into the subcutaneous, that fatty tissue that kind of looks like bubble wrap. The wound may be tunneled under the edges of the wound bed. So just think three layers of skin damage for stage three. Now stage four, this one is the worst. It extends all the way down into the muscle, bone, or even tendon. So just think four layers of skin damage for stage four. Now the unstageable one, huge NCLEX tip here. We have full thickness skin loss with two key signs to write down. S-char, which is known as black or brown dead necrotic tissue. So just think S-char is like coal because it's black or dark brown. And the second key term is slough, described as yellow and stringy. So I'd recommend writing these two down. Slough is that rubbery substance looking kind of like chicken skin. So think slough is like stringy chicken skin. Take a good long look at this nasty picture here. A lot of questions ask you to identify this one. Now, since there are two colors that are preventing visualization of the wound bed, it's classified as unstageable. 
These wounds typically need to be cleaned out or debrided in order to visualize the wound bed before a stage is made. So Hesse mentions, the nurse is assessing the skin of an immobile patient. Skin covering the sacrum appears to have full thickness loss, but the wound base is covered in black S jar. How does the nurse document the finding? Unstageable pressure ulcer. Now our last one here is a deep tissue, which presents as dark purple and will sometimes come open. The fatty tissue is injured below the skin. Now it's not typically tested, but I would be familiar with this one. Now in terms of the treatments, it really depends on the cause here. So for clients who are bedridden, we must first assess the skin and document, especially within the first 24 hours of admission. If not found and documented within the first 24 hours of admission to the hospital, then the hospital assumes responsibility of the wound, even if it's not the hospital's fault and not even caused there. So a full head-to-toe skin assessment is priority. We must take a picture and document and stage any wound upon admission. Next, we must turn every one to two hours, especially clients with high risk, like those who are bedridden. So make sure to write it down. This is done every one to two hours to relieve pressure on the bony prominences. Now Kaplan mentions, the nurse is teaching a client with a stage one pressure ulcer on the greater trochanter of the left hip. What should be included in the teaching? Change position every hour. Now in terms of nutrition, protein and fluids are priority here. So fluids at least two to three liters per day. This helps to build and maintain healthy tissues. Now, how do we know if the client has adequate fluids? Well, we monitor urine output. So write this down here. Urine output 30 mLs per hour or less. This means that the kidneys are in distress. Or in this case, it means we have less than adequate hydration. So Kaplan mentions, which finding contributes to delay wound healing in a client with a stage 3 pressure ulcer? Urine output, 25 mLs per hour. Yes, it has to be at least over 30 mLs per hour. Now, albumin is another key factor here. So, albumin normally should be between 3.5 to 5.0. Remember, albumin attracts fluid back into the vascular spaces to prevent edema, that waterbed-looking skin, and help the body maintain healthy tissues. So just be sure to write it down, albumin must be between 3.5 and 5.0. And lastly, we're always monitoring any pressure ulcer. We're looking at the stage, the size, and the color. And we can even use a key term, Braden scale. This is a rating system used to monitor risk factors for skin breakdown, which is typically done every shift. So just think the BS for Braden scale monitors risk factors for BS, broken skin. All right, that wraps it up. Thank you so much for watching. Don't forget to take your quiz and download the study guides. And also feel free to share the love, share with a classmate and even your instructor. See you guys in the next videos.